Good evening, all. I am Father Stephen Tamke from Christ Church in Manhasset here on sunny Long Island. Um, it is a pleasure to welcome you all this evening to our shared class um, on Melchizedek, led by our good friend and professor, Tony Lewis. Um, we will have questions and a time for conversation at the end. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to jot them down as we're going through, and Tony will be happy to um, engage with you once we get to the end of the presentation. So with that, it's my pleasure to welcome back one more time the wonderful and famous <laughs> Tony Lewis. Or infamous. So good to see you all again. This seems to be, this has turned into an annual thing, and I've enjoyed it. It's been a particularly lovely thing to do during the course of Lent and sometimes during the course of Advent uh, to take a little time to be able to take part of the Bible and to look at it more intensely as part of our own preparation for the celebration of the holidays that holidays that we're going to um, holidays that we're going to share in this case for uh, for the Easter season. So let us pray. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, here we are. And my thanks uh, to Stephen and to um, and to Josh and to, and to Rob for making it possible for me to have this conversation with you all again. As we look at one of the interesting things about the um, <clears throat> about the Bible, especially about the New Testament, and about the different ways that people talk about who Jesus is and what Jesus did, and in this case, the fact that in one particular book of the Bible, the way that Jesus is characterized is that he is the great high priest. Um, I'm going to ask um, ask that the screen be shared. Because I'm going to be looking on on the side at the um, at the text that you have that you have, um, and then you see the title page for this. It's called "Now This Melchizedek." Um, this is the name that figures prominently in Hebrews as a way of being able to understand who Jesus is and what what Jesus did in terms of his ministry as a high priest. What does that say on the side? Yes, it says the, the, a great high priest. It says it in, in Greek on the left hand side and, and then English on the other side of that icon of um, icon of Jesus. So let's um, we're going to take a look at um, take a look at, at, at parts of the Bible. We're going to be mainly concentrating on Hebrews chapters six, seven and following. And then uh, we're going to look very, very intensely at this question of this character who figures prominently in Hebrews as a description of who Jesus is. So let's go to the next page. And well, you know all of that, that's me looking a little teeny bit thinner than I am right now. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to recognize as we do this, the um, fact that Hebrews as a letter um, draws very heavily on the a background which can be found in the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to use that as a way of being able to isolate this character from the Old Testament, one who's appearance in the Old Testament is very, very brief. It's only found in one of the Psalms and it's also found in the books of Genesis and use that as a way to better understand how the church uh, understood who Jesus was and what Jesus did. And then we're gonna take a, a just at the very end of this, a chance for us to be able to, uh, to think about um, this implications for this in our life as people who belong to the Christian church um, and who can draw on this image of who Jesus is to better inform our own walk of faith. So that's what we're gonna to try to do during the course of our conversation this evening, okay? We'll take a try at the next slide. So here's the letter to the uh, letter to the Hebrews. And we'll try the next one. Chapters three through eight um, help us to see of the book of Hebrews, and this is, I will, I'll define it a little bit later as a friend of mine may have define Hebrews as the non-letter of non-Paul to the non-Hebrews. Um, chapters three through eight draw very, very heavily on the story of Israel as God's people, on Israel's wandering in the wilderness, and on the beginning of the setting up of, by Moses 
of the um, of the ministry of the people of Israel as they move towards the land of promise um, as a prelude to being able to talk about um, being able to talk about uh, this priestly ministry that Jesus Jesus is accomplishing in his own life and in his own action. And that first part of Hebrews, um, going on towards chapter eight, sets this up by making some claims about who Jesus is. That Jesus is greater than the angels. You'll see an argument that, that shows up in the first part of, part of Hebrews that says that Jesus, by who he was and what he did, is greater than the angels. Secondly, that Jesus is greater than Moses. And that's sort of a surprising thing because obviously the key character for the whole giving of the law and everything inside of, inside of the Old Testament um, is Moses, the great lawgiver, the great prophet and lawgiver. And then we're gonna find that in Hebrews that in these first chapters, the author is making an argument that Jesus is greater than the priesthood and then everything that takes place inside of the tabernacle, that place where the children of Israel, as they moved on towards the land of the pro land of promise, um, where they worshiped and where the presence of God, that blistering presence of God that's called the Shekinah, S-H-E-K-I-N-A-H, where the Shekinah dwelt. That meant that God, as Israel moved through the wilderness, as they moved through the wilderness, they were always accompanied by the presence of God in what was in the tabernacle where worship took place. But even that, Jesus was superior to. Hebrews is going to make that argument in the course of the letter itself. Let's try the next one. So here are three points about can be said about um said about the, about the children of Israel. Remember, we're talking about God's chosen people. Those were the people that we could see um, in the whole Old Testament story that had been chosen um, as the children of Abraham from among all the nations to be God's chosen people. And we follow that story, starting with the um, beginning of Abram's story until the people of Israel went um, down into Egypt the first time, um, at the time of, well, actually went down the first time, at the time that um, at the time that Joseph was taken off, um, then they um, came back. Then they went down a second time when they were enslaved by the Egyptians, and we know the whole story about the children of Israel being delivered at the at, at the at the, at the um, at the, Red, at the Red Sea, as they were being led out of Egypt into a land of promise. But we know that during the course of that time, that the children of Israel had some problems when they were in the desert. And that's why their getting into the land of promise wasn't immediate, but rather was the result of a slow process of being, of getting there. And during the time that they were making their way towards Egypt, uh, the people of Israel had problems. They would fall away, they would get rambunctious. There's a uh, wonderful um, Greek word that talks about what they were doing. They grumbled and the word is gone good so and you can sort of hear the word being what happens when people get together inside of the parking lot after service is over with on Sunday and something's happened and nobody really has said anything about it while they're in church. But once they get outside of the church's walls, they began to grumble and grumble and grumble. Well, the people of Israel sort of said, look, Moses, you led us away from being in Egypt, where at least we knew what we were going to eat and where we were going to sleep. You brought us out here into this land where it's desert and where there's serpents and other things and where the food is um, rather spare. And this manna just does not hit it for us. Uh, so we think it's perhaps time for you and others to give us something a little bit more pleasant to anticipate, that is either to go back to where we came from, or uh, maybe what we should do is just to take all of our jewelry and put it together and burn it up and mold it into a calf of gold, uh, thereby breaking the first of the commandments, you should have none other gods but me. I mean, you didn't even get down to something like coveting things or anything like that. And God's wrath was turned against the people 
um, the um, their way was um, extended so that they might get things back together and therefore that they needed to be people um, who did not, um, who, who were warned that they should not uh, fall into apostasy, that is to not trust God because whenever God makes a promise, God's promise is, is always going to be in God's good time fulfilled. So um, God chooses people, the people rebel as time goes on against God and then God warns people once he still says that he is going to remain true to his side of the, of, of the covenant, uh, not to fall into apostasy, that is, uh, to reject God and what God had planned for them. Let's see what the next slide says. Okay, Steve, Rob, there we go. Um, and this is summed up in some ways in, the, um, in, in, in one of the Psalms. Um, if you want, uh, if you want, 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 want to want to see ev evidence of it, um, you remember that we sing. At least in, uh, when I was in seminary during Lent, we used to sing the whole of Psalm 95. The first part of which um, had been shortened as a canticle that we sing, as an invitatory canticle called the Vanity. The whole come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Well, the tale of it tells the story. Of what um, what what was what was going on with the children of Israel, so the psalm ends by saying this: "Oh, that today you would listen to God's voice. Do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire." The uh, what had taken place and plagues that took place inside of Egypt. Forty years I loathed that generation and said, they are people whose hearts go astray and they do not regard my ways. Therefore, in my anger, I swore they shall not enter in my rest. Um, that was the um, sort of the guilty verdict that God placed on the people of Israel based upon the fact that indeed they had committed apostasy and that they stand, stood, stood, stood against him. But notice the words of this, this. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice, listen to the voice of God. This is a psalmist speaking. And God says, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness. And if you read the story of the first five books of the Bible, you'll see the ways that, that God's people tested God while they were in the wilderness the ancestors of those who were God's followers. They tested me, they put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, that long period of time, that generation said, they are people whose heart goes astray. They do not regard my ways. Therefore, in my anger, I swore they should not enter my rest. Now, if we listen to this and try to project upon it, the story of the Exodus, what we see is that the final goal in the whole Exodus story is getting into the land of promise. And people did eventually get there, didn't they? Uh, by the time you read the book of Joshua, uh, you get Moses and that whole generation dying off. But the, um, but the, um, but the ones who had been set free um, and who had sort of grown up in this 40 years of waiting were the ones who came over into the land of uh, came over into the land of promise. I want to take two phrases out of this and pick, it, pick them out because I think they will indicate where this author, what the author of Hebrews wants to go. One is the word today. What does that mean? What does it mean for this author of the Psalm to talk about today? Well, we've got the story inside of the Moses story. Um, that God said in his time with the children of Israel that today meant when the children of Israel had sort of done the last acts of temptation and rebellion if they could. And God was saying, you're not going to get into my rest, but God changes his mind. We've got the bits and pieces of it. Um, it was contemporaneous with Moses because we know that people just like Pharaoh in among the people of Israel did harden their hearts. 
they did not want to follow what God said. And there were places, particular geographical places like Massa and Meribah, um, where you could see instances where God indeed was put to the test uh, by, the, by, the, by the people. They would not listen to what he said. They did not, um, let me get a little bit more light here on the subject. Um, they would not listen to what they said, what he said. They would not obey him. Um, they uh, turned against him. And therefore, God says, they will not get into my land of um, land of rest. That's one way that you can take that word today and define what the time frame is. But let's think about it a little bit more. Does that today really just talk about that time? Or does the today talk about another time? Maybe it's the time when the psalmist was writing. And the question might be said, when the psalmist was doing the writing, when the psalmist was writing, maybe in his own time, people in his own community had repeated the act of hardening their hearts. And the question could be asked, could those people legitimately enter into God's rest? And then there's one more possibility. And that's the possibility of the time in which this letter, the letter to the Hebrews, was being written. Because at that time, for that group of Christians, some rough things were going on. Let me tell you what was going on. People in that time were suffering from a type of hardening of their spiritual arteries. They were tired out. They'd been doing the Christian thing well, sometime in the first century or so the common era enough, and they were just pooped. They didn't want to hold up their end of the bargain anymore. They had marched through the waters of baptism, and they had gone successfully through them. They had known the joy of having their hearts enlightened by God, and they'd gone on being practicing Christians for a while. And then they began to slump. And they began to have weary arms which would fall down. And they had begun to ask the questions, is it really worth all of this? I mean, I don't know about all of you, but I know that the Christian life is always a life of tension between the goals that I have as a Christian and what the opposition to my Christianity does to me, it can wear me out sometimes. And when it wears me out, sometimes I get to be hard hearted. And I get to look for something else that will take the place of what really, if you think about it, rests on faith alone. So the question is, could I really be tempted to the point, or as the people of the letter of the Hebrews were tempted to the point where they would take a walk instead of doing God's walk in their life? Would I have that situation in which I need something that would point me towards God's final rest for me? So you can sort of see that what he begins to do with these words from out of the Bible, from the Old Testament, because that that obviously was the scripture for the people who would read this letter. That, is, that, that this begins to be a letter which can be read on several different sort of time levels to talk about what happened in the past so that people can look at it, to think about the fact that if the person who's writing this letter could talk about a today, then the past which had been found inside of the inside of entering into the land of promise probably wasn't the final rest for people. And then to think about it in terms of those people who were hearing this letter as indeed we do as Christians of another generation and asking whether God's perfect um, gift of completion had taken place either in the time of Moses or in the time of David, or even in our time, unless there's something that gives reason for us to hope that we can find that rest. And that rest is Jesus himself. Now, this has to, among other things, give us a, um, 
give us a, a, a time to think about what the Sabbath is. And um, just remember, um, I, I don't think I really have to tell this to any members of this group that um, that the Sabbath is not Sunday. Uh, the Sabbath, of course, is Saturday. And the Sabbath in the story of um, in in the story of the of the um, of, of of God's actions in creation and in Genesis um, is the day in day on which God, having completed all of His works, took off from doing anything else. It is the celebration of completion. It's the celebration of creation being finished. It's an enchanted day because of this. And because of the fact that it is an enchanted day, God asks us to celebrate that day along with him. Because finally, in the work of creation, it was all done. So if you think about what we just saw a second ago and looking at that little bit about um, little bit about um, Psalm 95, if God is saying that that um, that Sabbath, excuse me, just for a second. Well, that did it. Okay. Um, if you think about if you think about um, if you think about Sabbath um, Sabbath as being the day when God had completed all of His works of creation, if you think about the fact that the whole question about whether or not Sabbath had been achieved in getting out of Egypt and out of slavery, um, and that word today, which shows up where the author of the um, where the author of um, author of Hebrews says um, says um, says uh, today, um, um, please listen. Um, I swear that he has they have not entered into my rest. Then there is the possibility that the time of rest is something which had been moved from the time of Moses, even to this day, to where we are now, to, to being the um, to being um, to being people that live after Moses' time, um, for whom. The idea of a perfect rest, where God has completed everything that He really intended to create, um, would occur, and that's where um, Hebrews opens up the possibility that the Sabbath did not come on the last day of creation. The Sabbath did not come when the children of Israel entered into the land of Egypt, but the Sabbath does come with Jesus, who, in His work, um, makes eternal atonement and gives therefore eternal completion eternal rest that's the mindset that the author of this letter is um, is, is 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 tending towards and that he's inviting us to look look towards okay let's see what the next slide says now in order to sort of make this happen what the author of hebrews has to do is to begin to think about Jesus in a different way. Um, and in doing so, what he does is to uh, begin to characterize Jesus not as, um, not as a suffering servant, nor as the incarnate word as we see it in John's gospel, but rather uh, looks at Jesus um, um, as being a priesthood and as being a priest. And to do that, I wanna say a few words just to talk about what priesthood is. Uh, the whole idea of having priests at all, and that's something that exists to this day, um, is the idea of preserving a faithful remnant. Um, and you, if you listen to the to the uh, to the Old Testament, um, you'll see time and time again where the whole of the people of Israel, um, by their actions, may be going to rack and ruin. But as long as there are just a few people who hold on to being faithful, God promises that he will spare the people on behalf of them. There is a wonderful story in Genesis, and you all may have, may have read it. It shows up, I believe, during Lent, where, um, where Abraham gets into this Middle Eastern, uh, it feels like a Middle Eastern market where people haggle and bargain with God. And um, he asks God, will you spare the people if there are a thousand who are faithful to you? And God says, yes, I will. Well, 
Well, God, well, what if there are a hundred who are faithful to you? And God says, well, if there are a hundred that are faithful, then I will spare the people. Well, well, God, what if there are 10 people who are faithful to you? I mean, it really does sound like going to, to the, uh, going and, and, and arguing over the, over the price of a car at the, at the car dealers. And God says, well, if you can only find 10 people who are faithful, I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll spare the people and, and not destroy them. Well, God, what if there's only one person who does this? And God says, if there's only one person who does this, um, I will spare the whole of the people. If there's one person who can with, with, can hold up faithfulness, God says that he will spare the people. And the whole concept of priesthood, as it existed then, and as it exists now, is based on that idea of the faithful remnant. Those of us who do the work of do the work of priests, I believe, have a great responsibility that's put on our shoulders. We have to be the ones who, on behalf of the whole of the people that we serve, maintain the faith as something that we believe and that we share with others to believe. That's the theology of the faithful remnant as it then moves over from Israel even into the Christian church itself. The remnant becomes the thing into which God's own promises can hook into for the sake of the people. Now, secondly, about a priest, what about who a priest is? Hebrews tells us that a priest is the one who in Israel, sympathizes with our weaknesses. That means that a priest is not a superhuman being. Part of what makes a priest what a priest is, is that that priest understands the fact that all of us as people are broken people. And part of that is that that priest bears those weaknesses along with those who are in the priest congregation among the priests, priest people. The qualifications found in the Levitical priesthood, and this is found in chapter five, verses one through 10, are the following. They're chosen from among the people. They're put in charge of holy things. They offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. They deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward. Priests are not, by qualification, meant to be religious gorillas. They offer sacrifices not only for the sins of the people, but also for the priest's own sin. And they're called to that office. That is, they don't call themselves somebody else calls them. They are not self-appointed individuals. As a modern day priest myself, the only way that I got to be one wasn't that I appointed myself to be one. My parish had to call me. And then the seminary where I studied had to call me. And then the Diocese of Virginia had to call me. And the Diocese of Long Island had to call me because Bishop Martin laid hands on my head. All of those people were people who participated in the act of my becoming what I became. I am not self-appointed. I didn't wake up one morning, one morning and believe in myself that this is what I believe that I appoint myself to be. The community has to be involved and God has to be involved in making a priest to be what they are. Okay, let's try the next one. So here, if you look at what you see in Hebrews, you'll see the evidence of the fact that the author has taken that template of what it means to be a priest and fit it into the life of Jesus. Chapters five through six, called and appointed. But the person who calls, Psalm two, verse seven, Psalm 110, verse 4, is God. 
loyalty to God, doing what God wants to do, chapters 7 through 8, including being obedient. But Jesus' obedience is obedience unto death. And therefore, if you look then at those two pieces of those qualifications you just saw, of what it meant to be a priest, Jesus fits. That he was a call for his ministry, that he was appointed to it, that he was obedient to God, followed what God wanted. He fits into that picture of priesthood and he fits into it in a way we're going to see that is superior even to that of the high priest of the temple. And here's where the problem point comes up though. And it's a problem of genealogy. And it's the fact that Jesus was not of the priestly lineage of Israel's priest. Sort of like being um, the monarch of England. That's a hereditary monarchy. Priesthood in Israel also was hereditary. hereditary, hereditary. If you were a priest, you belonged to a particular family, the people of Levi. And if you look at Jesus' genealogy, it, as you find it inside of Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 16, Levi's name is not mentioned there at all. So the question is then, did Jesus qualify for being a priest without being part of the priestly inheritance which the children of Levi would have? And the answer that uh, Hebrews gives is yes. And the reason that that answer is yes is that you'll find in the Old Testament one other type of priesthood. And there it is. It's the priesthood of Melchizedek. One other character who shows up in Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20, who was a priest, and who made offerings, but who came years before Levi was even born. And this picture that you see right there is a picture of um, um, of 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 um, El Mel of Melchizedek. Um, he's making offerings. Um, the offerings that he's making, we'll see that they're interesting, are offerings of bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God before the time of Levi and his descendants. So let's look at the next. Now, if you look at that little section inside of uh, inside inside of uh, Genesis, and I'm going to try to read it if I can. It shouldn't take me very very long to be able to um, being able to read it. Let's see what it says about about this character who shows up in Genesis 14, whose name was Melchizedek. We read this, Genesis 14, verses 17 and following. After his return from the defeat of Chadaloi Omer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley, this is Abram, of Shavne, that is the King's Valley. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, blessed be Abram by God most high, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him one-tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take goods to yourself. And it goes on to say that um, say that um, say that what had happened was that um, Abram had paid tithes to Melchizedek. So let's look at what this mysterious character Melchizedek was like. His name is sort of interesting because the name Melchizedek is the combination of two Hebrew words, the words Melech and Zadok. The word Melech means king. The word Zadok means righteousness. So 
this priest was the king of righteousness. He was also the king of Salem. And the little Hebrew three-letter root, S-L-M, is the word which gets turned in Hebrew translation alliteration into shalom. That's the word of peace. So he was king of righteousness, this Melchizedek was. He was king of peace. He was of antiquity. He came around before the priesthood of Solomon's temple and of Moses and Aaron. That's when Melchizedek lived. He was eternal. That is, we don't know where he came from and we don't know where he went to. He makes sort of walks on the stage and, and receives these tithes and gives a blessing and and after the, and and uh, and offers bread and wine. We don't know where he went to. Therefore, he had no beginning and no end. There's a rabbinic uh, maxim that says, if it's not in the Torah, it's not in the world. So there's no picture of what his lineage was. We don't know who his mother and father were. And when Melchizedek acts as a priest, what he brings out when he offers the sacrifice is bread and wine. And that's what he brings out when he encounters Abraham. King of righteousness, king of peace, before the time eternal, before the time of Moses and Aaron. Eternal, we don't know where he came from. We don't know where, where, where he went to. And finally, he uses bread and wine as his sacrificial, um, as his sacrificial media. This is beginning to sound sort of familiar to all of us, isn't it? Because it's beginning to sound like we know somebody else who would fit that particular profile. Okay, let's look at the next slide. And there's another picture of Melchizedek and Abram in the valley in the valley of Shavnit. Um, you can see that um, see that Melchizedek has the crown on his head. He's the king. Um, that's probably Abram there, um, having just gotten through with um, doing battles. There's the bread and wine down at that um, right below uh, Abram's uh, pike that he has in his hands. And those two bottles down, those two large containers right down there uh, are, are containers of quite a bit of wine. Um, that sort of reminds us of the, um, of the, of the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. Um, but, um, but there's a picture of it. So then let's see what happens, what happens. What happens next? Um, well, what about the relationship between Melchizedek and Abram? Because after all, Abram is the, um, is the great um, uh, ancestor of all of Israel. Uh, what does this tell us about the superiority of Melchizedek? First of all, Melchizedek blesses. He blesses Abraham. And there's a logical principle that states that the superior always blesses the inferior. Therefore, as a priest, Melchizedek is greater than Abram. Got that so far? Then this matter of tithes, and here you could look at Numbers 18, 21 through 32, where the Levites are authorized to collect tithes. This takes place before there were even Levites. They didn't exist because Levi hadn't been born. When Melchizedek collects tithes from Abram, since Abram was the ancestor of Levi, by logic, Melchizedek receives the tithes from Levi too, because of the fact that Levi was still in his ancestors' loins. Thus, Melchizedek the priest was greater than Abram and all his priestly descendants. So the conclusion then in 711 is that there's evidence of a priesthood that was not Levitical and yet was superior to it. As with Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace, superior to the priesthood of Abraham and Levi, Jesus belongs to that order of priests. It's an interesting piece of logic. So here comes going to church with Jesus. I mean, what's the implication of this? Well, it says that the high priestly ministry of the Son of God is the ministry of the most superior priest you can find. Here are the consequences of it. It doesn't take place in the tabernacle, that mobile shrine that I was talking about and that we saw before. 
where priestly ministry usually occurs. Why so? Look at Exodus chapter 25, verse 40. When God begins to set up this um, this uh, this holy of holies and this fashion of tabernacle in which the people um, people should worship, what he tells Moses, instructs Moses to do, is to build this holy place according to the pattern which exists in heaven. You see what that says? There's a heavenly temple where God is. And any earthly temple is nothing more than a knockoff of God's temple. It plays with the philosophical thought of, 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 the, of the Greek philosopher Plato that talks about the fact that the world, if you get in a cave and you look at the back of the cave while you're in it and people are outside, you'll see shadows. The shadows that you see are projections of the reality of the people who are standing on the outside. So if you're talking about what's real, what is reality, what's the most important, it's not the idea of what you see as the shadow on a wall, but it's what's on the outside that is the thing that gives us some, that, that, um, that is the reality. You wanna back that back up one more, one more time. Uh, there we go, Ralph, thanks. So therefore, what um, what um, what um, what the uh, what the author is sort of saying is that there is a true temple, but it's not any of the temples that we can see with our own eyes. The true temple is that temple that lives in heaven, where the true presence of God is always, and where perfect worship can take place. Worship for which our worship every Sunday is simply a shadow. True worship takes place in the true temple in heaven. And that's the place where Jesus goes after his earthly ministry has ended. You can think about what the duties of a priestly ministry would be, uh, the, an earthly priest. Um, or like myself, I, I conduct worship on Sundays. I do all those things. I tend the lamp still to this day. Um, I, I renew the bread of presence when I celebrate the Eucharist. Um, I offer sacrifice at daily and in, in, in ordinary times. And if you look at the next slide, now we can take a look at the tabernacle. Okay, there's what the tabernacle looks like. See, there it is. It has sort of areas of sanctity. Um, and at the back of it, you'll see that, um, see that, that, that sort of reddish box. That's um, that's where the uh, where the holy where the holy place is, um, and you can see the um, see the power of God, the presence of God descending upon descending upon that place. Um, that, that's the tabernacle as a whole. And if you push it back to, to the next slide, and see there's what it looks like on the inside. Um, it's it's the most holy place is all the way at the back door. If you want to think about it that way, there's a curtain. That separates the um, the the holy place from the holy of holies, and in that holy of holies can be found the ark of the covenant. Okay, I think that may be the next slide. Maybe it is. Oh, that's the high priest, and there's the high priest. That's the guy who would be who who, um, who who offers those uh, sacrifices dressed in these these gorgeous robes. Now the next slide, ah, okay, um, talks about why the high priest is so important. And you want to keep Jesus in the back of your mind when you do this. On one day of the year, which is called the um, called Yom Kippur, um, the high priest who is dressed up in all those gorgeous robes takes those gorgeous robes off and instead goes in wearing those linen robes which are on your left. Um, because he's entering into that holy place with blood in that saucer that is, is in his hands. That's the sacrificial blood that he has in his hands. What he's going to do is to apply that blood over the top of the Ark of the Covenant in that place where the Ark has two angels whose, um, whose, um, <coughs> whose, whose wings sort of cross over the top. And if any of you ever, all ever saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know what it, what it looks like. You'll see it in a second because there's a, a picture of it. They tie a, a, a rope around the high priest's legs in case when he goes into the Holy of Holies, 
um, he faints or something so that he can haul him out because nobody else is allowed to go in there. He only goes into that holy holies once every year because the sacrifices are made for every year. And then he goes and lays his hands on the head of a scapegoat and drives it out beyond the city so that the sins of the people might be driven away from the nation until the next year comes up and the next year and the next year. Okay, next slide. There's the ark. And you can see where the angels, um, angels um, wings cross at the top. Um, that place is called the mercy seat because the blood of the sacrifice, which is, uh, which is the thing which is crucial, is spread over there. Sacrifice isn't killing an animal. Killing the animal gets you the blood that you need in order to be able to put in that space and so that people's sins can be atoned for. Okay, the next one. Um, and there's just a description of the Day of Atonement. It's a repetitive day of reconciliation between God and his people. It happens over and over again. Only the high priest enters beyond the second curtain uh, with a blood offering for himself and the people um, where the life of the animal is, is offered for the life of the people. And the problem is that it did not guarantee the obedience of the people because they would be doing it a year again, again, and again. So what's happened now in our case? We have a law. It's found in Jesus and it's written on our hearts. Jesus dies and he enters into the holy place, not here, but in heaven. That's what the whole story of the ascension is. It's God going into heaven it's Jesus entering into heaven, having offered his own blood and saying really to God, here I am and I'm bringing all my children along with me. And he only has to do it once. That's the magical word from out of Hebrews, once and for all. It only had to be done once. We don't need to have it done anymore. We don't have to be busy doing the religion anymore because the true act of Total worship is something that God has offered for us in his son, by his death, for each and every one of us. And that's the thing which can regather us as people and energize us not to put our end of the tug of war rope down of living the Christian life. Okay, let's try the next one. And there's a picture of it. There's what worship looks like. But whether it looks like what's on the left where a priest is celebrating high mass or on the right, which is some little charismatic church somewhere. It is always eternally booked into what Jesus has done for us once. And we draw on that because it's his priesthood, not denominational priesthood, but his priesthood which is the thing that seals our reconciliation to God as ever. When we gather as a church, no matter whether it's the most humble place or the most complicated looking place, we gather as an outpost of God's heavenly worship. We do it in ordinary places because the ordinary shares with what is eternal. Okay, Rob, what's next? <laughs> I've sort of lost myself. So here are my conc concluding remarks. Um, this whole picture is, of Hebrews is a very complex word, complex story, complex description, which provides encouragement in which the Old Testament is read very closely and seriously. All the details of the Old Testament worship are very carefully looked at. It's a word of encouragement that has pertinence when it comes to where we are when we find ourselves in situations, the Hebrews situation, when we think that we have not attained rest, we have not attained entering into God's rest. This is a word that takes us beyond what we see and what we are towards heavenly realities. And that becomes the impetus for, we, for us to be able to move forward. We can sort of pick ourselves up in our Christian walk 
and walk forward because of the fact that Jesus has done this for us. We don't have to do this for ourselves. And the last thing I could say about this is this is an ecclesial word of encouragement. It's meant to revitalize the church whenever it is gathered for worship. It points us beyond old things towards new things, towards eternal things in which Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We have hope because of what he has done only once, once and for all, for you and for me. Now, I believe at this point, Rob is going to clue up, tee up a hymn. There is a word that you're, um, that you're going to hear you're said there that we're not supposed to be saying at this time in Lent, but indulge me. Okay, that's um, that's where I'm going to stop. Let me let me just say a few things. If you ever get a chance to do it, or 
can listen very carefully in your in your parishes when you do that. When you hear Highford all that hymn, it used to be hymn three forty seven sung. Think about the number of the uh, number of images inside of that hymn that are, that are drawn directly from the um, directly from the picture of um, of Jesus as, as high priest that shows up inside of um, inside of, in, inside in, inside of the book of Hebrews. Um, Jesus entering into the veil. Jesus being priest, being being the Lamb that was slain. Um, uh, Jesus entering there once and for all. Jesus being the um, being the triumphant King and all. See if you can just read for yourself how many of those images are ones that are uh, ones that are pertinent to the way that uh, at least the author of this particular letter talks about who Jesus is, and more importantly for us, what Jesus has done. And Rob and um, and 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 Stephen, there. I think I'm going to stop. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Canon Lewis, uh, for a really fascinating presentation. Um, thank you also for um, doing this without a printed copy. So welcome to the the uh, the COVID world of yeah. uh, working off the screen. You did just fine. It was great today. Um, well, I'm encouraged. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, uh, it was wonderful. Um, it's hymn 460 for those of you with your hymnal 1982 at, at nearby. Um, uh, so if you want to uh, have a look at it, it's a uh, um, Father Tampi and I were just texting that it's a top 10 for, for both of us. So Good. <laughs> yeah, uh, great hymn. Uh, are there any questions from the group? Uh, there was a lot of uh, information there. Any questions for the group? Everybody's muted, so if there's any, just, just wave so I can unmute you. Or you can unmute yourself. Oh. Are we in space? <laughs> I do see a question, so I'm just trying to unmute. Sorry. There you go. There you go, Tom. Uh, the Christians uh, attained the rest by the coming of Jesus and the fulfillment of his coming here. The Israelites also got rest unknowingly that they, they don't know that they also got the rest. Um, you'll, have to repeat the, you'll have to repeat the question. Um, the, I think I missed part of what you said. The Christians uh, received the rest after the coming of Jesus yes. and his fulfillment, whatever he did on this world. Uh, what about the Israelites? They are unknowingly; they also got the rest, isn't it? Yeah, the way that the way that um, the way that um, remember this is this is a Christian piece of literature. So they're raising the uh, so they're raising this question from the standpoint of what it means to become belong to the Christian community, and therefore what they do is they move from. Um, they move from God in creation of of, of all people, um, where the uh, where the Sabbath um, Sabbath became, where the Sabbath happened, and then they move historically a little bit later to the story of um, to the story of of Moses and the Israelites, um, and then what the author does is to say that you move to another period of time. Because if David is writing, assuming the fact that David was the author of the Psalms and using the word today in that Psalm, in Psalm 95, then um, the issue he says, as he looks at it, is that, um, is that evidently the answer of whether or not the rest has come um, still is an open question at the time of David. And now this author is sort of saying, well, what if, you know, we can push it one le level farther and say that beyond creation, beyond Moses, beyond uh, the time when David wrote Psalm 95, in our day as members of the community of um, community of, of, of the um, of, um, of, of, of the writers, writer, uh, writer of the Psalms, 
um, if rest hasn't been achieved, then then for the those who were part of the um, early Christian community who wrote Hebrews, sort of said, well, is it possible for us to think about where we are now, since we're having our problems as a um, as 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 a church community that's run out of energy? Um, do we need to consider the fact that that rest is there for us to be able to grab a hold of, just as much as it had been available for people to go hold on to in generations that came before us. So it's sort of updated, sort of constantly updating the um, updating the situation and saying um, saying that rest is available um, if we don't put down our arms like the children of um, Israel did inside of the wilderness. Um, and if we cling on to God and what God has for us in Jesus uh, to provide for us a way of being able to um, enter into his completion of all that he's that that he um, that God intended to do. Um, it's sort of successive generations looking back on the generation before and saying in each case, that wasn't it, that wasn't it, that wasn't it. And then you have this um, this character who's a priest who goes into goes into the eternal holy place one time, doesn't have to go in and out the way that the um, the way that the priests of Israel had to uh, had to go in and out of the uh, out of the holy place. And when he entered into that holy place, perfect peace was finally realized. Now, now it's available. Um, but if you would probably look at it from um, the standpoint of each of those each of those groups that you think, they would have probably said, "Oh, we we've, we've we've got Sabbath now. Now, well, here we are out in the wilderness with the with the tabernacle. No, well, here we are at the time of the Davidic kingdom. No, but here we are at the time of Jesus." Yes, and that's 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 really us as Christians or those people as Christians looking at the situation and 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 and, and looking at time um, in, in in sort of successive layers. Mm -hmm. So we, oh, sorry. So we do have another question, but Tony, I do a very quick answer uh, to this is because uh, I want to get to Julianne and uh, Mary Jane, and then and we'll wrap up from there. But do you think it's, I mean, this, I'm just thinking about what you were saying now, is it possible, I'm thinking of the, the idea of this, of going into the temple to offer sacrifice, and that we don't need to do that anymore, because Jesus has already gone into the heavenly temple to uh, having offered the sacrifice. Is it possible, and this is a, this, I don't want to open a can of worms and uh, for too much here, is it possible that Hebrews is written later than the destruction of the temple? And this is part of a way to deal with, we don't have the temple to, in which to offer sacrifice anymore. As in the year 70 or as in the year 130? I mean, um, because remember that you've got these, you've got the second temple destruction that took place in, in 70 or so, right. I think it is. And then you have the, um, then you have the, um, the final sack of Jerusalem in the, in the year, year 130 or so. Mm -hmm. um, um, obviously, I mean, the, te the temp temple was, um, by the time even the gospels were written, the temple was out. The temple was out of um, out of out was more or less out of business by the by the time the later gospels beyond Mark were written. Right. The temple was the temple had been closed down once because of the destruction that took place. Um, mm -hmm. The destruction that took place then, um, it probably argues for a dating of this thing sometime after, let's say eighty. Mm -hmm. But no one's really pinned down the date of it, Rob. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not a. Um, it's not anything that anything that anybody I've I've heard of has reputably reputably pinned down the data, and that's partially because of the fact that nobody knows who wrote it. Right. Great. Thanks, um, Julian and Mary Jane. We'll have our last question of the night. Uh, okay, we're we're unmuted. You're unmuted. You're good. Yeah, uh, there we are. This Hand may up. be may be a trivial uh, question in some regards, but. Uh, there are uh, large parts of the uh, book of Leviticus that mm -hmm. get very short shrift uh, in our uh, regular readings. Um, a, a comment. That the, well, yeah, except for um, those places and times when, um, when there is daily worship in a church. Um, and I was aware of this um, when, I was, uh, when I was teaching. Because it, they they developed a, a daily 
um, a daily celebration of the communion at, at, at the seminary when I was teaching down there. And there were weeks when there were when when there was lots and lots of Leviticus read, and it was read during the Easter season, if there was a daily Eucharist celebrated somewhere. So it shows up. It doesn't show up on the in the Sunday cycle that much at all, um, but it does show up in the daily cycle of, of of Eucharistic readings that show that that the church does. And I'm glad that it does. Um, I, I remember that it, it showed up to such an extent that that there were two or three weeks when I had a fair number of the services to do at the chapel. And each week I was preaching on Leviticus. <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, but, um, but, um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. It does not show up on the, uh, show up in the Sunday cycle. It does show up in the, um, show up in the, day, in the daily cycle. And it does show up in, when, um, when the daily office is read. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you all for, for coming out this evening uh, and signing on. Thank you to those of us who will uh, watch this, uh, will watch this rebroadcast uh, once the video has been uh, been set up. Um, uh, and of course, uh, I've enjoyed this partnership with, um, with Christ Church and, and uh, with Redeemer Springfield when we had them on board and Redeemer Addison before that. It's sort of a fun way to get a lot of uh, to gather, to use your language, a group of uh, of folks, and and um, and you know, Zoom's not a perfect medium, but it's a good one where we can we can get an expert in, and um, and we can all be together to enjoy a, a great conversation together um, and learn something new. Hopefully, um, I know I definitely. I definitely learned a lot this evening, and I hope you all did as well. And of course, Canon Lewis, thanks for for being a part of this and for um, sharing your wisdom. And uh, quick, just shout out to Josh Barrett um, who put the slides together. Uh, you know, he couldn't uh, couldn't be here this evening, so thanks to to him, the uh, the the chief PowerPoint slide priest. I guess we'll have to come yes. up with. <laughs> A, a good official title for him. So uh, let's. Uh, why don't we uh, close with uh, close with a prayer, and and we'll be on our way for uh, for the evening. Let us pray. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous. And all for your love's sake. Amen. Amen. Well, blessed Lent and uh, Holy Week and Easter to you all. Thanks for coming out. And Tony, thanks again for a great, uh, great evening. It's always fun to be with you all. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.